Good morning and welcome to the subcommittee on planning dispositions and concessions. I am council member Ben Kalos. You can tweet me at Ben Kalos and my is this mic loud. I'm the chair of the subcommittee. We're joined today by council member Ruben Diaz Sr. who always gets here early. Today we'll be holding hearings on three projects, land use item 265, Joe Central Brooklyn, land use 266, 464-68 West 51st Street, and land use item 279, Victory Plaza. We've also been joined by council member Chaim Deutsch. If you're here to testify, please fill out a white speaker slip with the sergeant at arms and indicate the land use number of the item you wish to testify on on that slip. Uh, Today we'll be doing hearings on the items and then voting on them later. So it will be uh, a little bit longer than normal, but we'll try to vote them out. Our first hearing today is on land use item 265, Joe Central Brooklyn, a jointly owned portfolio of 79 residential buildings in the Bedford, Stuyvesant, and Brownsville neighborhoods in Brooklyn, in the districts of Council Members Levin, Cumbo, Cornegie, Amprey Samuels, and Barron. Uh, and if we vote this out today, having gotten all the answers that we're asking, this might be a suiting birthday present for council member Steve Levin. Happy birthday, Steve. The 79 buildings contain a total of 525 units that provide rental housing for low-income families. HPD is seeking approval of a tax exemption pursuant to Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law. I now open the public hearing on land use item 265, Joe Central Broken. I would like to invite HPD to present its testimony. Uh, I will please ask the members of the panel for HPD to please state your names for the record, and then I will ask the council to administer the oath. Um, so as Chair Kayla just stated, please state your name before answering. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and in response to all council member questions? Lacey Tauber, yes. Denise St. Just Cordero, yes. Yeah, turn the mic on. Press the button. There you go. Charlie Stewart, St. Nick's Alliance, yes. Peter Madden, uh, Joe NYC, yes. You may begin. All right. Uh, land use item number 265 consists of an exemption area containing a cluster of buildings across central Brooklyn in council districts 33, 35, 36, 41, and 42. The project is known as the Joe Central Brooklyn LLC. It will combine nine existing portfolios that were originally conveyed to one of four nonprofit organizations under various HPD rehab programs, mostly throughout the 1990s and 2000s. Legal ownership of the portfolio will remain with the participating nonprofits, including St. Nick's Alliance Corporation, bed Restoration Corporation, Bridge Street Development Corporation, and Pratt Area Community Council, uh, aka Impact Brooklyn. At closing, the project will transfer beneficial ownership to an entity affiliated with the joint ownership entity NYC, known as the Joe. The Joe is a nonprofit membership organization that serves as asset manager for over 1,000 affordable housing units within the portfolios of 11 nonprofit members. The project is receiving a new first position construction loan from a private lender and gap financing through the city to fund rehabilitation. The Joe Central Brooklyn Cluster consists of 79 residential buildings on 79 lots in the Bed-Stuy, Clinton Hill, and Brownsville neighborhoods in Brooklyn. Uh, see attached for a full list of clusters by ownership. Uh, the project has a current unit count of 524 residential units, of which 25 are vacant. There is a mixture of unit types, including 33 studios, 179 one-bedrooms, 192 bedrooms, 108 three-bedrooms, two four-bedrooms, and 12 superintendents units. The project is 100% affordable, um, as all incomes will be restricted, not to exceed 100% AMI, with tiers at 30, 50, 60, 80, and 100% AMI. At least 15% of the units will be set aside for formerly homeless families. In addition to the residential units, there are 20 occupied commercial units, one vacant commercial unit, two community facility units, and one residential parking space that is rented out to a community member. The community facility spaces will not be included in the exemption area. Currently, the portfolio is undergoing a year 15 repositioning, which occurs upon expiration of certain provisions included in previously approved agreements. The repositioning provides for the financing of a rehabilitation to address immediate capital needs and deferred maintenance. HPD will provide city capital to finance the rehabilitation, as well as modify and extend existing debt currently encumbering the project. 
HPD will also restructure the legal rents for a percentage of the portfolio while ensuring that current tenants will continue paying their current rents plus any applicable rent guidelines board increases. The scope of work includes full roof replacement or ceiling, boilers, water heaters and controls, facade repointing and ceiling, interior painting, sidewalk and stoop repair, and select kitchen and bathroom replacement. The project development, uh, sorry, the projected development cost is approximately $95.6 million. Portions of the exemption area current, currently receive Article 11 tax exemptions that are set to expire in 2038 and 2041. Some have Section 420C tax exemptions that will ex expire in 2031 and 2045, while other portions have J51 benefits or no benefits at all. In order to facilitate continued affordability of the exemption area, the prior Article 11 and 420C exemptions must be terminated and replaced with an Article 11 tax exemption for a period of 40 years, coinciding with the length of the regulatory agreement restricting incomes and rents. The new exemption will be reduced by an amount equal to any concurrent J51 benefits. The cumulative value of the Article 11 tax exemption is approximately $86,860,594, and the net present value is approximately $24,266,351. And the developer also has a presentation that they'd like to go through with you, if time allows. Yes, please. Uh, my name is Peter Madden, and I am the executive director of Joe NYC. Um, Joe NYC stands for the Joint Ownership Entity of New York City. Joe is a nonprofit, and Joe was created by community development corporations in New York City. Uh, so we talk about Joe having 11 members. Those 11 members actually created. Uh, oh, we can hand this out. <laughs> um, so Joe was created by uh, uh, CDCs um, really in response to the concern that nonprofit owned housing was losing uh, market share to for-profit owned affordable housing in New York City. So Joe is fundamentally an effort to strengthen the role of community development corporations in New York City, um, and this project is uh, a great example. Um, Joe is committed to uh, long-term affordability, um, and uh, uh, at this point, uh, our 11 members have committed over 3,000 units that will be transferred into Joe. Um, as of today, we own about 1,050 uh, apartments around the city. Um, the, 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 the way that Joe is structured is that when, these, when our members transfer properties into Joe, they get a seat on the Joe board, meaning they have a they have vote on uh, all major do Joe decisions. Um, Joe, as the owner, is going to be able to collect uh, uh, cash flow in accordance with regulatory agreements um, and if, when the portfolio is doing well, we'll be able to distribute some of this net cash flow to our members uh, to, to reward them for the, 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 the management and asset management that Joe and the members are doing. Now, very importantly, um, Joe is not in the business of property management. Um, that is, always remains the role of the local CDCs. So, example, St. Nick's Alliance, who work in uh, uh, Greenpoint and Williamsburg. Um, they remain the face of their, the, the, the projects to their tenants. Um, and in addition, obviously, all of our groups do uh, lots of other very valuable services uh, in their neighborhoods, uh, early childhood, uh, after school programs, new uh, immigrant services. Um, none of that has changed by, by their involvement uh, in Joe. Um, we don't, I'm going to skip over that. Um, so uh, we have, uh, Joe is involved in quite a few uh, uh, transactions with HPD. This is the first one that is uh, looking to close uh, this Central Brooklyn project, um, and Charlie Stewart from St. Nick's is going to talk more specifically about this project. Good morning. Um, Charlie Stewart, I'm a project manager from St. Nick's Alliance, um, and we're um, leading the charge for this project on behalf of the four other groups involved. Um, so Joe's Central Brooklyn is a 524-unit, 79-building, scattered site, moderate rehab project. 
uh, consists of four Brooklyn-based non-for-profits contributing nine affordable housing portfolios to uh, form a larger combined project. Um, the, the groups are Impact Brooklyn, Bridge Street Development, Bed-Stuy Restoration Corporation, and St. Nick's Alliance. Um, there are 21 commercial units in the project and two com community facilities. Uh, average rents across the project are affordable to tenants earn, um, earning 46% of AMI. Uh, the buildings are scattered throughout central Brooklyn, uh, mainly in Bedford-Stuyvesant, and there's a scattering in Clinton Hill and about 20 buildings in Brownsville. The buildings themselves are mostly, uh, they're small, they're mostly uh, three to 16 unit buildings uh, with one 36 unit elevator building. Uh, at closing, the buildings will be transferred to Joe NYC ownership and we're targeting a March 2019 closing. In terms of the financing, uh, we're anticipating a private bank construction loan with an HDC permanent loan, um, approximately 40,000 per DU and HPD year 15 subsidy. Uh, there's currently $53 million in HPD debt on the properties which will be deferred and accrued. Uh, and the combined portfolios have uh, 7 million in existing reserves which will be, will, will be used to fund the development costs. We've also raised uh, $1.5 million in ResoA funding from council members Amphrey Samuel, Carnegie and Cumbo, uh, in whose districts the majority of the projects are located, um, and the uh, Article 11 real estate tax exemption, uh, which will help keep the buildings financially uh, solvent in the future. And then two assumptions that we're working through with HPD are rent restructuring three portfolios and uh, an allocation of tenant-based Section 8 vouchers. Uh, so we've put together a project team that's familiar with um, working with HPD and working through tenant-in-place construction uh, CTA Architects is our architect, and Natias General Contracting is the GC on the project. Um, this is uh, a moderate rent, uh, rehab project with tenants in place, as mentioned, uh, and the outcome will be to uh, increase energy efficiency and improve conditions for tenants. The scope of work includes uh, roof replacement or resealing. Um, each building will receive one of the two, depending on the condition of the roof. Uh, new boilers and controls depending on the condition of the boiler, facade repointing and resealing, um, select kitchen and bathroom alterations, although that represents a, a very small um, aspect of the project, um, interior painting, sidewalk and stoop repairs, uh, solar panels on 28 rooftops, and uh, as a whole the project uh, will consist of 68 DOB filings with 10 LPC filings for buildings, uh, 10 buildings located in landmark districts. The end. <laughs> Thank you for a uh, thorough and almost complete, nearly complete presentation. I really appreciate slide seven. If you can leave that up, that is what I would like to see on every project going forward. That is to HPD. Uh, this kind of information is very valuable. Uh, for HPD, uh, and, and just for members of the public, we meet with HPD and the developers beforehand to just get a sense of the project, both local members and this committee. And I noticed a number of the numbers changed between our briefing and this hearing. The project cost appears to have gone up by $2 million. The subsidy has gone up by uh, $4,000 per unit, and a number of other numbers have changed. Uh, so I guess the only thing being, uh, would it be possible to make sure that when we sit down we get the same numbers that uh, the Joe Central Brooklyn has? Yeah, I mean, I think there are some things that we're actually even still in the process of figuring out, including some of the rent restructuring. And so, you know, as we always say, you know, these kind of numbers can change up until the project closes. So, you know, we strive to get you the most updated information we can, and it changes day to day sometimes. I guess the first thing that's most poignant is I really appreciate your transparency about the fact that the average uh, median household income is 46%, which is families earning roughly around, I guess, 40,000 a year. Uh, you have 25 vacant units. Uh, and in the presentation, you indicated you were interested in making them available at 100% of AMI, which translates to roughly 80,000 a year, more than twice as much as the current residents make, do you believe that will have a gentrifying effect on those buildings and the surrounding neighborhood? 
so we, we intend to fill the vacant units with um, homeless uh, placement services tenants first, um, so that you know that we're in, we're working with HPD through that process. Um, in terms of the uh, the question of the gentrifying effect, um, you know these as on the aggregate the the rents are very low. Um, and uh, you know we need the the increase in rents to keep the the portfolio viable in the future. So it's really just having an effect of subsidizing the rest of the portfolio um, so that the project can remain viable. You just said that you're planning to fill the 25 units that are for 100 percent, eighty thousand dollars a year, as it were, with homeless set aside. Uh, with, with people who are formerly homeless, do you expect to find people who are formerly homeless making $80,000 a year? Because you concluded your statement with you need to charge more to subsidize the other units. So the statement you made had a conflict unless you're relying on an additional subsidy from Department of Homeless Services through link vouchers to uh, subsidize, further subsidize the project in a way that was not disclosed in your financing. So, yeah, so if I could speak. Um, so the 100% the AMI bracket, so sort of offsetting deeper affordability that we're getting here, the project is currently regulated at 50, 60, and 165. Um, and although we're still negotiating, we're absolutely looking to get a tier at 30% AMI. Um, that in, in tandem with the rent restructuring will allow the portfolio be stable. The 100% AMI units do not, uh, cross over with the vacant units. It's not necessarily so that the vacant units would be at 100% AMI. Um, those vacant units are currently being um, rented up to tenants that are being referred through homeless placement services right now. And then as we work with um, the Joe, we're negotiating where those 100% AMI units would be. It would only be upon turnover of you know, the existing units right now, and it would be a far smaller proportion of the units than we're looking to get at the 30% AMI bracket. What is the AMI of the surrounding census tracts? Um, it, it's a pretty broad range because there's a bunch of different, uh, well, I, again, we don't have it on census tract level, but we have it on sort of a, basically community district level, the neighborhood or population what is the area. And so it ranges from about 30 to 80 in, within this portfolio because it's 30 to 80. So I mean, we're talking about you know, so Brownsville you and, and Greenpoint Williamsburg. So it's a broad range in this area. Okay, so you're, you're actually 20% over the <coughs> local neighborhood. So would you consider lowering it as a firm commitment as part of this regulatory agreement from individuals making, hold on, 73,100 a year down to uh, individuals making 58,480 a year, which is still it, the high end for the neighborhood, uh, the, the sweet spot would probably be more accurate of if you're in between 30 and 80, it would probably be uh, the 60% the AMI, which would be for 43,000. At 100% AMI, you're looking at charging $1,500 for $1,510 for a studio, and uh, that, that seems to be quite a lot. So, so I, I think just to just make sure we're all using the same facts, the, the, uh, there would be, the regulatory agreement would permit in the future, upon turnover, some units to go up to 100. Um, that could. It, Is it some or all? So, so it would be a, t a tier at 100, would be the highest. There would be tiers at 30 AMI, there would be tiers at 50 AMI. So those would, in perpetuity, those restrictions would be in place. How many are set aside for 100% AMI as they become vacant? I, I mean, I think that's still something that we're negotiating. Um, you know, it's, it's something that as we're working through assumptions about how many Section 8 vouchers that we can get, um, that, that all impacts sort of the financing and stability in terms of the cash flow of the project. Um, we, we're absolutely looking to see as many of the 30% and 50% tiers that we can get. Um, and I, I think the other consideration here is that because they're existing regulated um, buildings, they, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't do anything to um, um, undermine the existing 50% and 60% tiers um, already regulated by HPD. So those would remain in place. Um, in addition to that, we're looking to get the additional tier at 30% AMI. 
With regards to, to that, um, when does this regulatory agreement expire? So the, the regulatory agreement that, we're, that we would be entering at closing would expire in 2083. 2083, that is uh, 75 years from, sorry, 65 years from today? That's right. Wow. I have never seen a 65-year regulatory agreement. I don't even know if I will be alive in 2083. Um, I, I think 100 is a good mark to hit, and uh, I'm not sure I want to be alive much longer than that. <laughs> so in, in terms of 65 years, I have never seen 65 years before. Um, I, I've had HPD come before me and say something is permanently affordable, but it's only been 40 years. This 65 years seems a lot closer to permanent affordability. It's at least a lifetime. What's, uh, to forgive my, my faith-based response because I'm celebrating Hanukkah, it's the wrong holiday, we don't have it for this holiday, but for another one, which is Manish Tana. What, what is the difference in this project that allows us to do a 65-year regulatory agreement versus every other project, and why shouldn't I ask HPD for 65 years going forward? Uh, so to answer the first part of that question, um, the existing portfolios, um, the majority of them have existing LIHTC um, tax credit uh, regulatory agreements on them. One of the portfolios, I believe it's the Jefferson Cluster, was recently acquired by St. Nick's. Um, at that time when St. Nick's acquired the portfolio, we extended that regulatory, regulatory agreement out to 2060, uh, 2063, I believe, 2068. Um, and per our year 15 term sheet, we extend the regulatory agreement uh, at new closing for the maximum of at least 30 years or 15 years from the existing regulatory agreement expiration. So what we're doing here is we're adding 15 years on to 2068 and that's how we're arriving at 2083. I will turn to council member Chaim Deutsch, chair of the uh, Jewish caucus and wish him a uh, Happy first day of Hanukkah. What would you bring me? Um, Manishtana. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Not even some Hanukkah gelt. Ouch. Um, okay, first question is, uh, you have a 15% of units will be set aside for formerly homeless families. What's, can you define formerly homeless families? Um, you can... So, so yeah, so there are families that are um, referred through our homeless placement services at HPD. Um, so they come through sort of internal refer referrals through HPD or DHS. Um, and those referrals get sent to the, to the nonprofits and then they're able to rent up the units through those referrals. But they're folks in the shelter system. Oh, so they, they are in the shelter system. So why is it formally homeless if they're in the shelter system? That's what I understand. Well, uh, I might have written that in the testimony. I think, you know, they will be formerly homeless once they're in these units, so. Oh, okay, yeah. so, so, they're not, so they're not formally homeless. homeless. Right, right. Sorry. Once they get into these units, then they will be considered so formally, be formally, okay. Correct. Trying to understand that, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, also, uh, most of these, uh, all these apartments are um, occupied, except for, tw uh, for 25, right? Um, so you have here the project, the scope of work that includes a total of $95.6 million, right? Over how long of a period will this construction be ongoing? So the, the $95 million represents the total, the total budget for the entire transaction, some of which is existing debt. Um, the amount of money dedicated to the hard costs, I think, is... Um, I'm sorry, I'm just looking. It's about 20, 23 million, um, and there'll be a two-year construction period um, for the renovations. So being that it's currently um, affordable, right? Mm -hmm. So um, when you putting in, uh, when you're doing work for $23 million um, as the management, um, how are you gonna be doing the work without actually chasing out tenants who are there because of the affordability by saying, oh, this work is being done, I can't take it anymore. How, how are you planning to do the work? Uh, are you, like, what impact it will have on, on tenants? Exactly. Um, so the majority of the work is, is on the building envelope and building systems and the exterior of the building. There's, there's very little work in the interiors. I see interior painting, uh, 
boilers, water heaters, which means the water would have to get shut off. Uh, correct. So we'll have um, we'll, we'll make uh, arrangements for that. We'll have whether it be temporary boilers or whether the work would be done uh, during the summer. Um, we will we have a, a team that we think is is very experienced in this type of work, and um, you know we're confident that that we can have minimal effect on tenants and. Um, you know, engage them preemptively and, and make sure they're aware of the scope and, and how they'll benefit as, as a result. How many apartments do you currently manage? Uh, St. Nick's Alliance? Yeah. Um, approximately uh, 1,200. 1,200, and this would add to it this addition, right? Uh, we would remain the same. Uh, St. Nick's would continue to manage uh, our uh, portfolios of Jefferson and Watkins, uh, and the other groups would continue to manage their, their own groups. So are you planning on hiring um, more people in the management, or are you going to use the same? Right, same. same. And that's going to be sufficient enough for all the work you're doing for making sure that the interior work and everything is done, um, you know, working with the tenants? Correct. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. Following along the same lines, this question goes to the Joe, to the extent that you have a, a less, uh, I work very closely with St. Nick's Alliance on a lot of different legislative projects, including protecting tenants from harassment during construction. Uh, but let's say of the different groups that you have, one of them gets a lot more complaints than others and gets more violations than others and is just one of the weaker parties. Uh, what happens? Who's ultimately accountable? And uh, then the same question to St. Nicholas Alliance of what if Joe it becomes less accountable. So first to Joe, then to St. Nick's. Sure. Uh, so, so one of the benefits of Joe, and I think what HPD has found attractive about working with Joe, is that when a property is transferred into Joe, it is the Joe board that has ultimate oversight. So the Joe board is the executive director, the, are the executive directors of these four groups and the other seven that are members Ultimately, if within a project there are, are specific buildings, specific property managers who are not uh, performing, the Joe board uh, in, in an extreme case would have the ability to force the replacement of a property manager. Um, so, there, so there are uh, you know, remedies at the Joe board level. And to St. Nick's Alliance, you're joining this board, you're losing control. Ultimately, there's a board that will have oversight, you need your boiler, people are, don't have heat and hot water, HPD is writing you fines up the wazoo, they're saying the financing, the money isn't there, uh, or they say, nope, we want to prioritize a different building first, they're in worse condition. How do you, how do you deal if uh, you, you end up in a situation in Joe where you're getting outvoted? Sure. Um, well, so St. Nick's would r retain uh, control over our buildings with our, our management, so we would have the ability to make those decisions on a property level. Um, in terms of the asset management level, um, you know, I, I think that would just rely on clear communication with Joe, and um, as, as Peter mentioned, our executive director is on the board of Joe, and uh, it, it would just be, have to be a, a clear and transparent uh, conversation and, and address any issues as they arise. Hey, HPD, I, I think I've just outlined a, a situation. Where, where does the buck stop? Who, 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 who is going to run these buildings moving forward? Is it Joe or is it the existing management? And if there's a conflict between the two, who wins? So I think between HDC and ourselves, um, a, as we've put together the financing of it, HDC would be asset managing it. Um, but certainly because the, the deal encompasses all of the, the portfolios, no matter which is the nonprofit member that originally, um, you know, retained ownership, we would be able to proceed against the, the entire, um, all four purchasing members and the Joe if um, either HDC or HPD had concerns about its asset management. So let's, let's talk numbers. Uh, all the parties involved in this are nonprofits. Uh, even if the Joe itself is structured as an LLC, is that correct? Yeah, the, the, the Joe LLC, just to be clear, it, the sole member of the Joe LLC is the Joe not-for-profit. So the Joe not-for-profit, you know, ultimately uh, uh, controls the LLC. I see a developer's fee. Uh, oftentimes when I see nonprofits, I rarely have ever seen this. You're asking for 
approximately $4 million in developers' fees. You're deferring 1% at 1.3. Uh, that still leaves uh, $2.6 million. Why do, why do nonprofits, so, so just to HPD, are there any nonprofits you're aware of that have ever waived their developer fee? And then to the Joe, why do you need a 3% developer's fee? I'm not aware of a nonprofit that is, has waived the fee. Um, the only thing that I would note here is that, um, you know, with respect to the developer fee, the developer also has to put in some equity. Um, so we've, that we've asked that they contribute to that, and you'll see that number um, presented there on the, the slide here. So that's $400,000, but that still doesn't account for the, uh, that, that just takes it down to $2.2 million. So why does the Joe need $2.2 million to manage these rehabilitation projects that are already being managed by nonprofits? So that, that fee is split among all of the groups. It, the fee doesn't go specifically to Joe. It is split amongst the four members and Joe. Okay. Um, and I just, it seems like it's a, a high. Uh, with regard to permanent sources of income, I, uh, the Article 11 does not seem to be reflected in this list, unless it is and I'm missing it. I'm sorry, in the permanent sources? Where, where would the Article 11 that you're seeking be reflected on this project? Because at this point it nets out, but with the Article 11, you're, you're receiving 80-something uh, million dollars cumulatively, which seems to make this balance sheet not quite work. Right, so in, in terms of a permanent source, the, the Article 11, the benefit wouldn't necessarily show as a source, where, where it's showing, though it's not um, very obvious here, is the additional first position debt um, the private debt that they're able to leverage uh, because of the Article 11. In terms of the numbers you're showing me, the sources and the uses, and they're coming out even, is what is the cost? Why do you need $80 million if it seems like all the other sources of income are covering your uses? Right, so this is assuming, the, these numbers assume an Article 11 benefit so it w without that benefit, the, the amount of um, money they would be able to leverage for the first position loan would be significantly lower, which means the city capital would have to come in um, and cover that gap. So I think, uh, sorry, my site's not so great. I think we're around 25 million here. We would have to probably go up to 60,000 per unit were it not for the Article 11 exemption. Okay. Uh, with regards to slide uh, six, you've got uh, several buildings, 79 buildings. It appears that only one of them is ADA accessible. Is that correct? Uh, I'm, I'm not. I 524 total units in 79 buildings, and then it says mostly three to 16 unit buildings, one 36 unit elevator building. So I'm just deducing that we've, we're only gonna have ADA accessibility in one out of the 78. Is that accurate? Correct. At what, and I believe HPD, we've done buildings with 16 units that re had an accessibility feature. Is that correct? So it, it varies portfolio to portfolio in terms of the accessibility requirements. Um, here there's, there is in fact just one elevator um, building that would be readily accessible by tenants. That Out that of your 1,000 or so tenants, is anyone disabled? Uh, I would imagine they are. Um, you know, th these are existing buildings. Uh, adding any ADA feature, we haven't looked into it. I imagine it would be um, very expensive and um, you know that hasn't been part of the project up until now. It appears that you're doing facade and entrance work? Correct. Is it possible to add ramps as part of that entrance work? Uh, that would have an impact on the project financing that we would we would have to look into. Um, we would have to HPD, do you think it is an important, it is, do you think it is important to uh, make your buildings uh, ADA accessible and that if we can at least make the first floor of some of these buildings accessible, that that could open up a large percent, even a small percentage of this portfolio to be accessible to the residents 
And then back to the Joe, would you allow residents to move down if you actually were able to make the first floors accessible? Start with um, HPD. That's something we can look into. Does everyone on the panel agree that we want buildings to be accessible? We want disabled people to be able to age in our city? I, I see nods, but yes. I don't see, uh, I don't yeah, hear I mean, we, we absolutely will look into it as existing buildings. That type of, you know, adaptation um, can be very expensive. So, we, but we would absolutely look into it. I, I think that making an entrance is a, a laudable goal. Uh, on slide eight, you disclosed uh, your architects and other contractors. A question that I ask is about uh, MWBE participation. Uh, this was not disclosed in the sheet. What is the MWB representation in terms of your team and overview? Is CTA architects and MWBE? There, I don't believe so. I, I don't believe they are. No. Is NOTS general contracting an MWBE? Uh, I'm not aware. Um, I can check on that. HPD, is this project covered by MWBE guidelines? It, it is. Do you think it is important that on a day that you're coming to ask for a vote the same day as a hearing, that it is important that you know whether or not your applicant is abiding by any MWBE guidelines? Well, I, I know for sure that Notaya's uh, general con contracting is not an MWBE, but often once we close, they, you know, they seek to um, subcontract out to MWBEs, um, and certainly this project will be required um, to meet M MWBE thresholds. Is Uh, do I would we also add that there's a couple uh, organizations that are part of this portfolio that have their own um, local hiring programs that they might want to tell you about. Uh, yep, uh, St. Nick's Alliance and bed -Stuy Restoration have workforce development programs um, which we're, we're actively working on um, the solar piece. Uh, they, uh, for the solar installers, that organization, Harvest Power, is working with our groups um, to pursue local hiring. So we, um, it, it is a, an importance for these groups. My favorite part of this hearing is uh, asking if you have this local hire pro program and opportunity to do solar work, who should somebody watching at home call for a job? Um, St. Nick's Alliance, uh, our website has um, a page dedicated to workforce development uh, and bed -Stuy restoration as well. Um, those organizations um, would be happy to, to um, work with anyone in the community who's interested in uh, not only the solar, but also uh, the construction trade and the other uh, offerings that the groups offer. And so that's available at stnicks alliance.org slash workforce. I believe so. <laughs> and we will have that number for folks uh, in a moment as soon as the internet at the city council loads. Uh, your office is at 790 Broadway in Brooklyn, New York. The hours are 9 to 5, and you can call at 718-302-2057, <laughs> and uh, I would appreciate if the applicants had that information at the top of their head. That is not a new question. Uh, with regard to the commercial space, there's 21 units. One of the things that we're looking at in particular is how we can make spaces available to mom and pops, especially as they close, uh, and, and so, what rates will those be available? Will they be affordable to mom and pops or will you just spike their rents to support the larger uh, project as well as uh, what are the plans for the two community facilities? And that concludes my questions. Sure. Uh, so those, uh, those commercial units are at least at market rate. Uh, however, the organizations that, um, that own those units uh, have a tendency uh, and a mission to rent to, to mom and pops and to local groups um, that otherwise uh, wouldn't be able to afford um, the rents in that neighborhood that are, um, you know, increasing uh, every day. So they, they have a commitment to it, but they also um, have a commitment to, um, you know, achieving um, close to market rents. What are the community facility uses? Um, so those are the offices of Bridge Street um, Development Corporation, um, and, uh, and that's their, their headquarters. Both, both community facilities? Correct. There, is there an opportunity to make additional space available for community facilities that aren't being used by landlords? Um, we, those spaces are being underwritten as, um, as commercial units. Um, 
so the, the rents on those units are, are higher than the community facility. Um, so uh, at this time, no, but we can. Um, you know, we can so, so just to be clear, you have a community facility obligation. It's being used by Bridge Market, which normally would qualify, but in this case, they're a landlord. So I don't think that that is proper. So I'm just saying, will you make two spaces available for actually community uses that aren't being used to manage the buildings? Bridge Street Development does a number of other community services in the neighborhoods. At other, those locations? Than, at, that I'm not sure about, but I know that they, you know, as a CDC, they do a lot of other things besides being a landlord. I, I appreciate that, but if they're using the community facility space to be a landlord, that's, I believe, a breach of intent. We're joined by council member Andy King. Um, so I think that is something that should be looked into. Are there any members of the public who wish to testify? Seeing none, I'll now close the public hearing on land use item 265. Our second hearing today is on land use item 266, 464-68 West 51st Street, which consists of two five-story buildings providing 11 units homeownership housing for low-income families in Clinton neighborhood of Manhattan, Speaker Johnson District. HPD is seeking approval of a 30-year tax exemption pursuant to Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law. I'd like to now open the public hearing on land use item 266, 464-68 West 51st Street. I'd like to invite HPD to present its testimony. If HPD can please state their names for the record and our committee council will administer the oath. Um, as the committee chair, just subcommittee chair just said, please state your names before answering. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this subcommittee and in response to all council member questions? Uh, Genevieve Michael, I do. Dariasco, I do. Please read your testimony as quickly as possible. Land use number 266 cons consists of an exemption area containing two privately owned buildings with commercial spaces located at 464 and 468 West 51st Street, Block 1060, Lot 61, and 160 in Manhattan Council District 3, for which HPD is seeking an Article 11 tax exemption. The property was taken into city ownership in 1978, and tenants subsequently entered into the tenant interim lease program. As part of TIL, tenant associations enter into a lease with the city to maintain and manage buildings in which they live. HPD staff assists tenant associations in establishing regular collection of maintenance charges and provide training in building management, maintenance, and financial record keeping with the ultimate goal of preparing them to be well-functioning and financially vi viable cooperatives. On August 15, 1991, resolution number 12 29, the council approved the disposition of 464-468 West 51st Street, and on November 6, 1992, the building was conveyed to the existing tenants as a low-income cooperative subject to Section 576 of Article 11 of the PHFL, which states that a household's income cannot be more than six times the maintenance fee, including utilities. The building is fully occupied by, occupied by shareholders and comprises 11 units with a unit mixture of eight one-bedroom and three three-bedroom apartments. Maintenance is $329 per month for a one bedroom and $517 per month for a three bedroom unit. Additionally, there are three commercial spaces that are currently leased separately to a restaurant, a bakery, and a market. As mentioned, the project is fully occupied. If in the future a shareholder decides to sell their vacant unit, vacant units will be priced to be affordable to households earning up to 120% AMI, which is 125,160 for a family of four. For 2018, the maximum resale price for a one bedroom would be $422,381 and for a three bedroom would be $573.99. Also, 30% of the profits of each and every resale, disposition, or other change of ownership of shares in the HDFC allow for individual units to be returned to the co-op. At this time, the shareholders of 464 and 468 West 51st Street have applied for rehabilitation funds under HPD's Green Housing Preservation Program, which provides low and no interest loans to finance energy and water conservation improvements and moderate uh, rehabilitation work. The purpose of the program is to assist small and mid-sized building owners lower operating expenses to ensure the long-term physical and financial health of their buildings, as well as preserve safe and affordable housing for low and moderate income households. The building will undergo a moderate rehabilitation consisting of capital improvements such as boiler replacement, oil to gas conversion, and pipe insulation. In addition, energy efficiency and water conservation work that includes low flow faucet, aerators, and shower heads, steam heating upgrades, and LED lighting is set to take place. No re relocation will be necessary as all work will be done with tenants in place. The cost for rehabilitation is estimated to be 200,000. The building currently receives a partial tax exemption that is due to expire in 2029. 
Therefore, in an effort to help maintain continued affordability, HPD is before the council seeking a new Article 11 tax exemption that will coincide with the length of a 30-year regulatory agreement establishing certain controls on the property, including hiring a third-party manager. The current cumulative value of the tax exemption is $2,308,464, and the net present value is $877,603. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any members of the public who wish to testify? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing on land use item 266. Our third hearing today is on land use item 279, Victory Plaza for property located 3-11 West 118th Street and 1460-1472 Fifth Avenue in Councilmember Perkins District in Manhattan. This project will facilitate the development of a new nine-story, 135-unit, 100% affordable residential building for seniors 62 and older in Central Harlem. 30% of these units are reserved for formerly homeless households. HPD is seeking an amendment to a previously approved Urban Development Action Area Project under Resolution 2507 on August 5, 1997, pursuant to Article 16 of the General Municipal Law. HPD specifically seeks to change the project summary to allow the construction of a new building, an area that was previously used for a parking and open space. Before I open the public hearing, um, just want to make sure folks know that they should uh, submit any questions, any, uh, speaker slips if they wish to speak. Um, I'd like to now open a public hearing on land use item 279, Victory Plaza, and like to invite HPD to present its testimony. Please identify who is on the panel. We've been joined by council member Vanessa Gibson. Genevieve Michael. Jenna Brannis. So I will swear you in, and Genevieve, you were just sworn in, so just a reminder, you're still under oath, and for the rest of you, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before the subcommittee and in your answer to all council member questions? Yes. Yes. You may begin. This item consists of a... This item consists of an amendment to a project known as Victory One, located at 11 West 118th Street and 1460-1472 Fifth Avenue, Block 1717, Lots 28 and 33, formerly Lots 28 through 40 in Manhattan District 9. The original project was previously approved for development by the Council on August 5, 1997, Resolution Number 2507, under HUD Section 202 Supportive Housing Program for the Elderly. The existing building is located on Block 1717, Lot 33, and contains an eight-story building with 109 dwelling units for low-income seniors, a superintendent's unit, 15 parking spaces, and open space. Under the amended project, the owner will convey Block 1717, Lot 28, which is underutilized to a new sponsor known as Victory Plaza Housing Development Corporation, who proposes to construct a new building under HPD's Senior Affordable Rental Apartments, SARA, program that will be known as Victory Plaza. Projects developed with SARA funding are 100% affordable rental housing for low-income seniors that must also set aside 30% of units for homeless seniors, seniors generally referred through the Department of Homeless Services or other municipal social service agency. Income is limited to 50% of AMI, and all tenants will pay 30% of their income as rent due to Section 8 project-based vouchers. Approximately 40% of units are designated permanently affordable. The new building will provide approximately 134 studios, one one-bedroom, and a one-bedroom unit for a superintendent and a new parking lot with 10 parking spaces for existing Victory One residents and staff. Additionally, administrative office space will be provided for building staff, including full-time employees, such as an on-site super, a porter, a residential project manager, and a social worker. A community room and open recreational space will be provided as well. A supplemental project summary describing the new project will be added to the existing project summary approved in 1997, which will remain unchanged. Additionally, there will be no changes made to the existing Victory One building. In order to facilitate the construction of the new building, HBD is before the council seeking approval to amend the original project. Thank you, council members. My name is Rick Gropper, and I'm one of the principals of Camber Property Group. We are in partnership with HCCI developing the project called Victory Plaza. HCCI is a nonprofit, Harlem based coalition of community leaders and churches that was established in 1986. And HCCI owns and manages affordable housing in the Harlem area, as well as provides services for its constituents and for its residents. 
and Camber Property Group was established about three years ago. We own approximately 2,500 units, the majority of which is affordable housing, and we um, do both preservation of existing affordable buildings, where we buy buildings and extend the regulatory restrictions and uh, undertake improvements to the properties, as well as ground up new construction, where we build affordable housing, um, both for people um, at and below 6% of AMI, as well as people who um, have uh, more moderate incomes. And we do that around the city. In terms of community engagement, we take it very seriously. And um, that's some, one of the things that we're planning to bring to the Victory Plaza project in terms of community outreach, local hiring, and MWBE hiring. Victory Plaza, as Genevieve mentioned, is 100% seniors affordable building. And it caters to some of the most vulnerable people in New York City and in the immediate area uh, in particular. Seniors are, um, about 40% of them actually, are uh, receiving some type of government subsidy. And this project will take some stress off of the system by providing 135 units of 100% affordable, low-income seniors housing. And it's something that caters to the AMI, both in the immediate census tract, which is $60,000, as well as in the two surrounding community dist districts, 10 and 11. The property is located at 118th Street and 5th Ave. The property consists of an existing building, which is 110 units, it's 109 plus a super, as well as land that's unimproved. And the, uh, the plan here is to subdivide the land using the ZQA bonus uh, for affordable independent residents for seniors as the existing building is a HUD 202. So we're using that additional floor area, we're subdividing it. We are then building the affordable seniors building on, um, on the development site. The original site, which is uh, called Victory One, was transferred to HCCI, our partner, and they used that to build 110 units, which is the HUD 202. So we're subdividing, we are um, spreading that same deed restriction to the development site. So it'll be um, used, the whole thing will be used in perpetuity for housing for elderly persons of low income. When we are, um, are complete with the new building, there'll be a garden behind it, about 3,000 square feet of community space um, on the outside, as well as 3,000 community, 3,000 feet of community space um, as well in, on the interior of the building. In terms of financing, we're using tax exempt bonds, tax credits, subsidy from HPD and HDC, as well as project-based vouchers that are being issued by HPD, but the funding ultimately comes from HUD. In terms of affordability, I mentioned before that the deed restriction is being spread to the whole site, so the whole thing will be used in perpetuity for elderly persons of low income. 58 of the units will be extremely low income, and uh, that will be a permanent restriction. Per the SARA, which is HPD's Affordable Seniors Program term sheet, we're doing 30% of the building for, we're reserving 30% of the building, which is 41 units for formerly homeless people. The balance of the building will be for individuals and couples, uh, all of which will be on the project-based voucher contract, and the residents of the building will earn, will pay no, no more than 30% of their income. The income restriction for the building is 50% of AMI and below, um, but there will be a variety of incomes under that tier. As um, I mentioned before, seniors as the most vulnerable population in New York City, or one of the most vulnerable, um, a lot of times have little to, um, to no income and, and many times it's, it's on a declining basis. The whole project will be built to UFAS, uh, UFAS standards. It will be built to New York City Building Code in terms of accessibility 
and um, there will be a live-in super as well as space for social services. Social services will be provided by HCCI, our nonprofit partner, and um, they'll provide a variety of services for, in terms of case management, um, such as financial consulting, um, job training to the extent that's necessary, coordination of health services, um, and facilitation of, of home health care services. We have a robust MWBE and local hiring program as we do on all of our projects. We'll, we'll be targeting a goal of 2.7 million of MWBE contracts and we're going to be doing outreach to M and WBE subcontractors as well as unbundling bid packages and um, making a very aggressive effort to exceed this requirement. In terms of local hiring, we're, uh, we're committed to 20% from the immediate area. And um, if anyone is interested in a job, they can call me directly at 646-598-7412. We have a project-based voucher contract, which means that there, uh, there cannot be a community preference, but we're committed to um, doing extensive outreach to both CB10 and CB11. The project is in CB10. Um, we're, we'll be working with Council Member Perkins as well as other community leaders and stakeholders to make sure that we can target the, um, the property and, and uh, target the local community uh, as we're, we're leasing up the building. And uh, with that, I will conclude and um, look forward to any questions. Thank you. Uh, I always appreciate when somebody appears prepared and has the information uh, for folks if they're interested in applying for jobs. Uh, I have a total project cost of 63.2 million, is that correct? Uh, yes, it's changed a little bit, but yes, that's right. What is the current number? The total cost is 64.2 million. Okay, give me one moment. What are the hard costs? The total hard cost is 41.1 million, including contingency. And what are the soft costs? Soft cost 13, uh, sorry, actually uh, 21 million. Uh, that appears to be a, one, uh, a, a soft cost of approximately one third. Sorry? It appears that your soft costs are approximately one third of the total project costs. Is that correct? That nod does not count for the record. Uh, yes, it's actually thirty-two percent. Is 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 that a a normal amount? Do you regularly see a thirty-two percent soft cost on projects? I think it depends. I mean, it can it can vary depending on what um, what kind of project it is, what the total hard cost number is. In terms of the unit size, what is the size of the studios for seniors? Is it uh, the, Z I actually opposed the ZQA shrinking of units for seniors. I believe the, the rule was 435 square feet and I believe that got shrunk in ZQA. I think they were willing to go as low as 175 and I believe we ended up somewhere in between. What is the size of your studios? Approximately 450 square feet. Thank you, that is a, a good thing. With regards to the total land value, what is it? The total land value is approximately 1.4 million. Say it one more time. The total land value is approximately 1.4 million. I have an estimate of 10.5. Oh, there, the 10.5 is the unrestricted value, as if it were a market value but the, the total land value that um, we are paying to the existing building to subdivide the land is 1.4 million. Uh, what is the, uh, is this project going to receive any subsidies such as a tax abatement? Yes, the project's receiving a 420C tax abatement. How long will that 420C tax abatement be for? 40 years. Uh, is that a full or partial? It's a full. 
uh, what is the uh, cumulative value and what is the net present value of that 420C tax abatement? We have that. It, this was very comprehensive uh, testimony, so if it had been included, we wouldn't have needed to ask questions on the last one. We didn't actually need to ask questions because it was so comprehensive. The total, uh, the, the net present value is 9.7 million of the tax abatement. And what is the cumulative? Going to guess it's somewhere around 40 million? That sounds right, but we don't have the exact number uh, with us. Are there any other subsidies from HDC? Yes. There is uh, there's a second mortgage from HDC, which is seven point seven million four hundred eighty thousand. Is there low-income housing tax credits on this project? Yes. Uh, at what rate? It's a uh, dollar and five, 105. Are you receiving any federal uh, support? Just the project-based voucher contract. Is that through HUD or through HPD? It is issued by HPD, the funding is from HUD. Any New York State funding? There's no New York State funding. Any city capital? Yes, there is a third mortgage from HPD, which is part of the SARA program, and that number is 7,295,197. 7 million how much? 7,295,197. Are you getting any additional FAR? We are transferring all of the FAR uh, under the, the air, as, as a result of the AIRS bonus to okay. the development site. But you're not changing the FAR We're on not. the site? We're uh, not. Any private funds? Uh, no private funds. There is deferred developer fee. What is the developer fee? The developer fee is $8.3 And this is under ZQA, but not MIH? This is under ZQA, but not MIH. Will the individuals who are working to construct this building work in the build or work in the building afterwards require affordable housing from the city or uh, in, in which you're contributing to the affordable housing crisis that you're trying to help us avert? or will you be paying people such that they don't need affordable housing from our city? I think that, that um, the people working both during construction and, uh, and in the building once it's built um, will require, I mean, could require some level of, um, of affordable housing. The project is prevailing wage during the construction period um, so the, uh, the workers will receive um, a, a decent wage. Um, they'll also be provided the opportunity to uh, receive benefits to the extent they would like that. Um, and, and during the, uh, the permanent phase, the, the workers will also have the opportunity to receive benefits. Those are, that is, good, that is a good thing to hear when you say words like prevailing wage. I believe that they will get compensated and uh, while it is true that there is affordable housing at 165% of AMI that I have opposed in this committee, uh, I think that if folks are earning uh, above the 100% AMI working on your job site, that that is not necessarily contributing to the crisis. So that, that is good information to have. Uh, with regards to the folks that are uh, going to be building, sorry, uh, that, that are going to be doing the work? Uh, are the, are, is your architect uh, the contractor or is uh, Camber yourself an MWBE or led by uh, people of color or women? 
Uh, no, we're not an MWBE, nor is our contractor, uh, but we do have a robust MWBE and local hiring program per um, HPD's build-up requirements. We have a goal of um, 2.7 million approximately to um, targeted to MNWBE subcontractors. We're also oh okay. We're also um, uh, committed to a 20% local hiring uh, requirement on the project. So the people who are working on it will will be um, ideally at least 20% of that will be from the immediate area. Thank you. Are there any members of the public who wish to uh, testify? Seeing none, I will now close the public hearing on land use item 279. We'll now vote on land use items 257, Clinton, your A site 7, land use 258, 590 Southern Boulevard, which were the subject of hearings on November 15th, land use item 265, Joe Central, Brooklyn, land use 266, 464-68. West 51st Street and land use 279, Victory Plaza, which we just heard today. All the local members are in support of the aforementioned applications for turning to property in their districts. Land use 257, Clinton URA Site 7, will facilitate the development and completion of a project at, uh, all of this was actually read earlier. Uh, the approval of land use 259, 590 Southern Boulevard, where HPD is seeking tax exemption to Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law will facilitate the preservation of 27 unit HDFC co-op. I will now call for a vote to approve land use items 257, 258, 265, 266, and 279. Council, please call the roll. Chair Kalos. Aye and all. Um, Gibson. Deutsch. I know. King. I don't know. The land use items are approved by a vote of four in the affirmative, no negatives, no abstentions, and will be referred to the full land use committee. We will hold this uh, committee hearing open for an additional eight minutes for a council member who is here early but may wish to join in the vote. I'd like to thank the council and land use staff for preparing today's hearing and members of the public and my colleagues for attending this meeting. Uh, we will hold this open until 11 a.m.